Hello, I'm Roger Dove, and as many of you all know, I put a call out on Instagram for questions. It seems you had lots. I love answering them, and so I'm trying to answer as many as I possibly can, and I hope you find the, the answers are interesting. Maud Camo, how very kind of you to comment that I have beautiful shirts. They're very uh, polarizing, because I know some people hate them, but I love them. I generally get my shirts either from Versace or Dolce Gabbana. They're my two favorite uh, houses. M. Podoski, you ask an interesting question. Is there any hidden symbolism in perfume? Often the inspiration uh, inspires a hidden concept. So next year I'm launching uh, a fragrance for the Royal Opera House in Oman. And there's a very, very particular raw material I found, uh, which most people would have no idea what it is, but it makes the connection between the story and the scent. Uh, sometimes symbolism can be something like the size of a box or a, a number of centimeters in a tester unit or so yes the answer to your question is definitely there is Steffi M01 asks, can I um, elucidate on the different varieties of oud I find oud is a fascinating material that everybody is really fixated by it I never get asked the question can I expand on the different varieties of jasmine or the different varieties of rose. Uh, I'll answer your question this way. In the end, you have to choose the best oud for the scent, but that is true for every single, uh, single fragrance. In the Middle East, they have ouds and they have what they call French blends. French blends are where there's a little bit of oud mixed around other raw materials in the way of French perfumery. And I would say that that is uh, what I do. So the thing of saying whether it should be from Laos or from Vietnam, Cambodia, whatever, uh, I, I don't think is really relevant. I don't know if that answers your question. I do hope it is. In the end, the oud has to be the right thing for the end uh, creation. A masterful desktop asks the question, when I make a perfume with oud, which region do I go to for the oud? Oud really is a very, very complicated raw material. The region, in my opinion, is somewhat irrelevant unless you're using the oud in a pure form. Uh, the oud is there to give nuance and a particular effect. And it's really important to understand that you can't just say, oh, oud from here is the best, or oud from there is such and such. Because oud ages, which is a very, very unusual quality in this raw material. The oldest oud I ever smelt was 120 years old. Who can imagine it? It's called sticky oud. So just saying oud from there, but it's uh, the age, the concentration. So always with oud, it's about what is the best for the end effect you want to create. Maha M. Khan asked me, is there a particular scent experience that I'd love to be able to recreate? I think that's really quite a simple one. It would be the scent of my family home. Um, if I could have bottled it and been able to take a breath of it from time to time, I'd be a very, very happy man. The Fragrance Nerd asks, I think, a fascinating question, and that is really, in the broader sense, what is the future of perfumery? Um, I really don't know. I think that uh, we're sort of going through this enormous transformation at the moment. The fact that I'm talking to you and you're able to talk to me uh, 10 years ago, that would have really been impossible. And the fact that the community talks to itself and alerts itself of uh, all the different things that are available around the world. So I think that we're going through an enormous transformation because it's all about, uh, truly about creativity. The communication alters it. I think that the industry is uh, reacting to it, I hope, in a very positive way. I think the demise of the department store we're seeing around the world will also have an impact on how fragrances are shared and announced and so on. From a manufacturing point of view, which you also ask, uh, as we look at uh, natural isolates, which uh, chemists are always looking at, hopefully new ones get discovered, they always are, and that gives us something new and fabulous. I love perfumery because it's amoebic. It has always, always managed to change, preempt, or follow uh, fashion. And I think that that's happening at lightning speed. I am Daniel Haddad Ask, what does love smell like to me? Um, I would have to say it's embodied in a good night kiss. Uh, it is a, a scent that I tried to capture of the gentleness of kiss, specifically a kiss my mother gave me. But it's not the idea of capturing the scent of my mother. It's the idea of the gentleness of a kiss and 
and unquestionable love. That was always its story. So the answer is a good night kiss. Karch Karch, you ask, which scent would I pair with Macallan 3? Uh, some of you maybe know I made a, a whiskey for Macallan. It sold out, but I did. Uh, I would say there are two. If you're really uh, tasting that whiskey and you're taking it very seriously, so you want to be studious and so on with your approach, vetiver, I think without any maybe. If you're wanting to just have the most hedonistic and indulgent uh, experience with it, then I would say Enigma. I think that bright booziness that you get from Enigma through the um, cognac would play very, very nicely with the Macallan 3. Fragtastico, uh, hi Javier, I hope you're well. Uh, the question you ask is interesting. What do I think of companies giving money to influencers uh, to help create a scent? around the influencer. Um, it's a difficult one, you know, it's why not, it, but it also depends how serious the project is and how good the person is who's going to end up making the fragrance. Uh, the language which is really needed to help a perfumer create something is most likely more difficult than people might imagine, but if it ends up giving something which people love then why not? Um, one of the issues also with working with an influencer to create a scent is that you put the nose out of everybody else. Um, because if, if you choose one or you choose five, think how many people there are in the global community who love fragrance and write about fragrance and support fragrance. So supposing you, you um, were excluded, how would you feel? Of course, it would be wildly exciting for the people who were chosen. So I, th I like the thing of it being uh, neutral of not tying up with anybody and I, I, I personally feel the same with ma major firms that use this face for something because you either relate to it or you don't so I think that it ends up becoming uh, too polarizing too exclusive too um, it loses what what I love about scent and that is scent should be as egalitarian as it can be um, so I, I, I think potentially it could be divisive and leave people upset Beauty Boulevard NG, uh, you make the comment that I have always said, I didn't once say it, I've always said that you should first of all put on your fragrance, then you apply cream. The logic of that is you would never dream of putting a moisturizer on your face and then spraying an alcoholic toner on the top because alcohol will break the cream down. But your question is, surely when you then rub the cream, if you put it on top of the scent, you're going to damage the molecules in the scent. I think it depends how much friction you use when you rub. <laughs> if you're really rubbing your skin that vigorously, I don't think you're doing your skin much good. So if you think when you put a cream on that you're, there's no friction there, so there's nothing which is called cause heat. It's the heat which causes the distortion. So unless you're rubbing your skin in such a way it's causing friction, I promise you it's safe and I promise you the result is better. All you need to do, I'd recommend it to anybody, on one arm, spray fragrance and put cream. On the other, put cream and put fragrance. See what you think is better. Saeed from Insta, you ask, how do I feel when somebody smells something of mine and compares it to something else? Or it, it, maybe they make a connection to something else. I think if you look at every creative art and if you read any um, articles or, or books on the development of creative forces, whether that's music or painting or literature, you see that there's always that connection. Think of Falvis, think of Dardarists, think of Impressionists, think of Modernism. So when an idea comes, uh, even maybe in one subconscious, you, you pick something up. So some of my work might make you think of something else. Uh, nothing is ever meant to be a copy. Nothing ever has been a copy. Uh, and if it does, if the work's great, I can only take that as a compliment, can't I? Hamza Motor 753. You asked me a question, which I'm sure the answer is going to be a surprise, uh, because it was definitely a surprise to me. There was no doubt when I launched Roger Parfum that it was what I was almost, to say destined to do is not right, but there was no doubt in my mind it was what I wanted to do, because I wanted to create something to, to leave a legacy for my family name. Uh, I could not have guessed the success we had with it. We launched it, as many people know, exclusively in Harrods. We were told how much stock to make. We were told the amount we would make would last for 
four to six months, we made that amount. We sold out of every piece in 10 days. So suddenly, every day we've got the box maker making as many boxes as they can, the fillers filling as many things as we can. Uh, they're all being shipped to every part of Britain and then back in the store. So the biggest problem we had was uh, the practicality of logistics because I couldn't have guessed that the brand would have been the success uh, it turned out to be. Um, and in some ways it still utterly shocks me. Um, you know, the, we've just had our 10th birthday and to think that we're now in over 50 countries, in over 300 and whatever the number stores are because I'm, I can't quite remember it. But it's, um, that's been the biggest uh, difficulty, but what a lovely problem to have. And it really has been a lovely problem. Charles King 95 asks the question, what ingredient is the most difficult to balance in a formula, either because it overwhelms everything or because it gets lost? Uh, there are two which spring to mind. The first are the aldehydes. They're, <laughs> uh, they're very interesting. If I put aldehyde in a room, if I'm teaching people about perfumery, for example, the moment you give aldehyde, all everyone can smell in the room is aldehyde. So over, it tends to overwhelm everything and it's handled really, really carefully. And very often, a lot of scents have the most minuscule amount of aldehyde to give them a little bit of life and lift, even if you wouldn't say the scent is aldehydic because it's such a small amount. So that's uh, difficult. And then the other side of that, I would say, are the woods. Uh, people always think that wood notes are big and strong. Generally, the only big, strong wood notes are the synthetics. Um, but I would say certainly a material like sandalwood. Sandalwood really plays a trick in your nose. Uh, one minute you smell it very clearly, the next minute it feels as though it's not there. So getting the balance of sandalwood right in a formula is uh, tricky. And another one, sorry, as I'm talking, uh, just popped into my mind. The same is true of violet. Uh, violet, after a while, you're, it plays a trick on your nose. You can't smell it anymore. Um, so that's sometimes very difficult. It's in the form of methyl iodine before somebody else writes the question in. It's always methyl iodine. Um, but the violet note, yes, plays this trick in your nose. But Aldehyde, because it wants to be center stage, and sandalwood, because it wants to be shy and hide in the wings. Ellen Mayle, and I'm really sorry if I pronounce your surname incorrectly, uh, asked the question, if I were to capture this moment in time, everything we've just been through in a scent, what would it be? I in fact have, it is Manhattan. Uh, th the thought behind Manhattan was, uh, inspired by the adversity of the 1920s when everything crashed and collapsed and people committed suicide, that somehow we always fight back and we bounce back and uh, the feeling of joie de vivre. And I think that that's really important. I think it's, it really is the embodiment of the human spirit that however hard things are, somehow we manage to bounce back or we, we try to make the, the best of things. And so that's uh, what I try to do in, in uh, the scent Manhattan. Marvsa, you asked the question, what makes a scent complex? Uh, I would have to say the ingredients and the volume of them. So natural raw materials have an, in, an innate complexity to them. So if you take a raw material like jasmine, it has over 900 molecular parts, which make just that one smell, that one ingredient. So imagine if you use a lot of natural raw materials, there's this incredibly, in, incredibly complex light and shade nuance in the scent. Um, if you make a scent which relies very heavily on synthetics, they are, it's a molecule, so you tend to get these sort of monoliths and therefore don't get the complexity. So the more natural raw materials in a scent, the more complex the scent will be. Therefore, the more intriguing and hopefully captivating.